Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullens, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. It is great to be back. I was just telling Anne, one day I was, I was here and I was in the uh, lunch line a little bit earlier and there was a, and this guy comes up to me, he's like 90 years old and he's got his tr uh, tray too and he says, uh, he goes, boy, nice crowd today. You coach football? And I thought that was, I thought that was the greatest really. They, uh, but uh, things are going well at Tulane. We have a brand new business school building opened about 10 months ago, which is uh, pretty fantastic. We're averaging about 41,000 applicants for uh, uh, 1,600 freshman slots. So all that part is, is going well. I will say that uh, these students, you know, as a baby boomer, a lot of baby boomers, you know, look down on the younger generations. And I don't at all. I think these folks are terrific. And we're very lucky to hand, uh, hand the ball over to them. So it's, uh, they're smarter than we were. They're more community minded. Um, you know, sometimes you worry about common sense. I had, I had one student uh, went to pick up his girlfriend at her parents' house, and the dad says, uh, hey, I want my daughter back by 8.15. And my guy's like, whoa, mid-August? Cool. You know, so it's, um, so we do have issues, but um, they, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about where we are in the markets and uh, Louisiana's economy and the and the rest of it as well. Let's see. I got the yeah. Here's the, don't uh, don't take any of this too seriously. Um, let's see. I guess uh, 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 business cycles. The business cycle has not been canceled. Uh, you sometimes worry about that. It, you know uh, what I've been hearing mostly is the uh, is you know that this time it's different. You know it's uh, and uh, those are the four most dangerous words in finance. You know the seven most dangerous words are hey we're getting the band back together. But that that is um, <laughs> and uh, and there are four cycles. If you look back like in oh I guess oh nine ten that would be the one on the left the early cycle fiscal and monetary stimulus. Fed lowers rates, the government spends a lot of money, economic growth starts to increase. Then you get to the mid-cycle, which was probably starting in around 11 and 12. Margins start to peak. Uh, management begins to increase their share repurchases to boost profits. And we're somewhere in this late cycle. Fiscal and monetary restrictions. Employers have trouble finding available workers and wages increase. Uh, I'm, I kind of have a front row to the U.S. economy. Uh, I talk to executives each week and executives for the Birkin Road Company. And, um, and that's everybody's biggest problem is finding labor at, at this point. And then eventually you get some sort of economic contraction, falling manufacturer, retail activity, and earnings and credit lending drop quickly. We're somewhere in the late cycle. The question is, are we two months away from a recession or two years away from a recession? And that's what we have to think about. The average, uh, when we look at uh, expansions, they usually go seven to ten years, and we're at the at the ten year at the ten year mark. Um, that's a pillow I had made. It's um, they it's uh, they <laughs> seem like a good idea at the time. There's a. Uh, yeah, you know, I got to interview the other day was the, um, and he was a nice guy, really smart, is the guy who's the CEO of Tabasco. And uh, we were talking about all these things. It was, uh, it was downtown. And I asked, him, uh, I asked him, what are some of the oddest things people put Tabasco on? He was telling me bagels and things like that. But then he told me that he puts a drop of Tabasco in his coffee and it brings the taste of the beans out. And um, so I came back, my wife's a big coffee drinker, and I told her that, and, and she's much smarter than me. And she looked at me and she goes, uh... He sells Tabasco. You know, it's um, the, uh, it's uh, really was the key to that story. So, um, the, uh, when we've, uh, and remember, if uh, and I got this from the Bible, I was a combination finance theology major, and um, I don't think that exists. And uh, they, uh, if you give a man a fish, you know, he eats for one day, but you give a fish a man, he eats for like two and a half months. So just, uh, just keep that in mind. They, um, we. We've uh, we've had six uh, six recessions uh, in the last uh, 50 odd years or so. This is the longest one. Was the last one. It lasted 18 months, and you can see we get through them. Uh, if you've only been through one recession, the 0809 downturn, that's not indicative of what a post World War II recession looks like. They're they're much uh, much smaller, much calmer, and. and much shorter. Uh, one thing that has predicted all the recessions th since 1972 is an inverted yield curve when short-term interest rates are higher than long-term interest rates. And we've seen that hold for about three or four days 
about five or six times in the last couple of months. And so the signal might not have gone off completely, but it's certainly uh, indicative, and I think that's a, um, a very important, uh, important note. I look back all these years, I've been in this business for 40 years. Uh, you know, I've taught at Tulane now for 33 years, which is, uh, which is odd, because now undergraduates are coming up to me and saying, uh, you know, my mother had you. You know, it's like, it's like, excuse me, what are we talking about here, you know? And um, so it is, uh, um, sorry about that. They, uh, there's a, <laughs> I crossed that off and put it back on. That's the way they kind of, um, they, uh, and I know I'm getting old because in class the other day, this, I guess last year, I, in the fall class, I was bragging about the fact we worked very hard over the summer and we got all the paper out of the class and it's now all, all online. And I said to the class, yep, last year we were the Flintstones, this year we're the Jetsons and not a single damn soul knew what I was talking about. It was like, oh, yeah, this is a, oh, they just run out the door, you know. Uh, um, some research we've done has straightened some things out, and now we, we have, um, you can't leave this room because it's pretty, uh, it's just ours, but I just want to let you know that interest rates are directly tied to the height of the Federal Reserve Chairman. And, um, and uh, this took a lot of work, and, uh, and it's, and it's true, you know, Paul Volcker was about six foot six. Uh, he was under the Carter administration, the beginning of the Reagan administration. And then Alan Greenspan was a much shorter guy, and rates went down, and Bernanke was even shorter than him, and then Janet Yellen was kind of tiny. And, um, and now uh, Powell, Jerome Powell's a, a regular-sized guy. He's about six feet, and uh, rates have been going up. So I think, um, I think we, we've captured that one, which is very, very good. They, uh, they uh, let's see. Uh, We've got two very different signals going on. The bond market is telling us uh, to be bearish about the economy, a recession is around the corner, and the stock market is telling us to be bullish about the economy, and we'll have to see, uh, see which one shakes out in here. And uh, there's a lot of confusion. A lot of people don't know much about the economy, you know, and I think that's, that's making, it's very difficult to make uh, economic news to be able to understand it, you know, because a lot of these people are the same people that, you know, same people that use Ancestry.com as a dating site, you know, so it's, um, you know, just not, not throwing stones. I'm just saying, you know, there's, um, let's see, they, uh, uh, profits count a lot. If you want to know where the stock market's going, it's all about corporate profits. That's true for an individual company. It's true for the markets as a whole. And, uh, and there's uh, Richie Rich, who is kind of a, one of my personal heroes as a child. It's, uh, actually, this market has been so good and I've made so much money that I'm now paying a guy to walk around my Fitbit. It's, uh, it's just, <laughs> that is money. That really is. And um, let's see. The, uh, and the reason the stock market has gone up and up and up and up is not, you know, I travel around the country and people go, it's a casino. I don't know. First of all, it's casino. I don't know why we got that. But it's, um, but it's not. It's all based on corporate earnings, and uh, you can see that in 2011, the S&P earnings were at a record. They went to 61 bucks, and it's gone up basically every year since then. The last couple have really been tied to the, uh, more to the tax cut, and uh, so we see that, and that's the direct relationship. Uh, that's what's important. That's what you have to keep your eye on the ball on. The rest of it is noise. The rest of it is meaningless. The rest of it is like the, the first three quarters of an NBA game. It just doesn't matter, and it's uh, so... <laughs> And, and you can see we've been in a bull market for a long, long time, exceptionally. If you look at the bottom three bars, uh, Obama's first term was up 101%, his second term was up 66%, we're already up 30% under President Trump and just over, uh, just a little bit over half a term, uh, term there. So it's been going on a long time. It's a, uh, it may be a little long in the tooth, but it's a, it's a big deal. And a lot of this money has been going into share buybacks. Corporations have been taking a lot of money, a lot of the money they got from the tax cuts, just plain earnings, and they've been buying back their own stock. Because if it's earnings per share that drives stock prices, the equation is profits divided by shares outstanding. So companies realize they can keep the same number of profits and just use spare cash to buy back shares and then that lowers the denominator and raises the earnings per share which is a uh, it's great to be with a crowd like you because you you know you know terms like denominator which is great and uh it's uh you know because you know what they say they say we're only using 20 percent of our brain and every time i hear that i think damn what am i doing with the other 70 percent you know so it's um it's uh it is uh 
One thing that's bothered me, uh, last year over a trillion dollars was bought back in stock by companies. One thing that bothers me is a lot of companies borrowed a lot of money to buy back stock, and it's leveraged up a lot of balance sheets that probably could not take it if we, uh, if we had to uh, have some sort of a downturn. So two sides to this. A rising tide doesn't, and this is the truth, the S&P is isn't as broad as you think. Like the Dow 30 is 30 stocks, and the Dow S&P 500 is 500. I know I'm breaking a lot of new ground here. And, um, but, uh, but the market cap weighted. So if you took Microsoft and the FANG stocks, which is Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and uh, Google, if you added those five together, they control 16% of the weighting of the index instead of 1%, which they should. So what you've seen here is those tech stocks have done a lot better than the overall market. I don't think the market, I don't, there's a lot of cheap stocks out there. There's a lot of cheap, uh, fully a quarter of all the S&P stocks are in a bear market. They're down more than 20%. There's great companies down 30, 40, 50%. But everybody's looking at that S&P 500, and I don't think that's, uh, that's really representative of what's been going on. Uh, this is an interesting thing. This is the Fed model. This is what the Fed uses to try to determine whether stocks are cheaper than bonds. Uh, if you remember when Alan Greenspan kept talking about irrational exuberance and everybody got all angry at him, this is the model they would, they would use. And it's basically the earnings for the S&P 500 divided by the price of the S&P 500. So earnings in 2019 should come in around $167. The S&P is at $2,800. And it's showing that the this is what they call the earnings yield. This comes out to 6%. And if that number is higher than the yield on the 10-year bond, which is 2.35%, it means the stocks are a better buy than bonds are historically. And so at this point, as much as the markets have gone up, they still look more attractive than bonds. I think bonds are still pretty scary. I think, uh, you know, I know a lot of people think, uh, well, a lot, there's a lot of people against the Fed now. This is really crazy. These are, I have former students at the Fed. I have, I have friends at the Fed. They are smarter than me. They are better dressed. They have less body fat. These are, um, <laughs> these, these are really sharp people. I am terribly worried about politicians making these decisions. You know, like uh, it has recently uh, come to my attention that uh, some of our imports now come from other countries. You know, it's, um, I don't, we can't do this. We can't. There's a, uh, or, or boy, that boy, that boy's civil sandwich is short of a picnic. You know, and um, it's, um, no, we need actual economists running this. And uh, so, uh, and remember, the, the people say the Fed sees inflation where there is no inflation. But that really isn't true because they're trying to keep inflation between zero and 2%. And, um, and really, uh, the most important factor in inflation is wage price inflation. And that's going up at a rate of 3.5%. So there's other things holding it back, but it's not as if they're making it up. They, in higher, bon uh, higher bond prices, higher interest rates will hurt bond prices. A lot of people say, what happens if the scandals continue in Washington? Uh, well, most people quote Watergate. And that's 18-month period from February of 73 to uh, August of 74. The S&P fell about 30%. But... And that's what everybody uses. But that was the same exact period as the first oil embargo, the first Arab oil embargo, which if you're as old as me, you remember waiting in gas stations for gasoline. And that brought inflation and stagflation and higher interest rates. So you can't separate those two things. So people will say that to you, but I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's really appropriate. One of the industries that's having a very, very tough time is the oil industry, which is very important for Louisiana. That's I've fallen and I can't get up. And um, they're not all like that. That's, that only is three legs. And, um, but it is uh, something missing. And, uh, but it, particularly the offshore oil industry, it has, been, it has been five years since the Saudis opened the spigots. And it is unbelievable. Um, you know, Bristow, the largest helicopter company, is bankrupt. Petroleum Helicopters is bankrupt. Tidewater is bankrupt. Banks that had a lot of loans to the oil industry, like Mid-South, got clobbered, and eventually they were bought out by, by Hancock Whitney. It's everywhere, and uh, it's never lasted this long. And uh, we have to kind of see where this goes. There is a, it is a, it is a real issue, and I actually don't see the light at the end of the tunnel here. Uh, now, the lower prices, the pump have been saving consumers billions of dollars, and that's good news for retailers because you know what they say. They say the, I read that in the Economist. What's that? The, um, oh, what does they say that? Oh yeah, the less cash you put in the tank, the more junk in the trunk. That's what they say. And um, they. Um, no, that, no, actually, that came from a rap song, now that I think about it. But it's um, still very good, very good. And, um, and uh, it's also good news for manufacturers and other businesses, such as the airlines. You know, the airlines haven't made a profit since Kitty Hawk, you know. And, um, and uh, 
And now they're really making money. You know, the planes are full. Their largest cost is fuel, and it's down considerably. And they haven't lowered fares. Um, and so, and some airlines are uh, some airlines are actually, I think, gouging a little bit. Like one small airline I just read is now charging for emotional baggage, which I, I think is <laughs> I think it's just terrible. Really, it's a uh, fear of commitment. One hundred twenty-five dollars. So there's um, they. Uh, and I don't know if you saw this story in the New York Times, but it was about a year ago. German Chancellor Merkel is like the hardest working woman in the world. She's trying to hold up, you know, trying to stave off Brexit and she's trying to hold up Greece, you know, and everything. And so she's traveling back and forth, back and forth. And she goes through Orly Airport in France, which some of you have been in Paris, and she has to go through customs just like everybody else. And so the first cus French customs officer uh, gets out his book and he says, uh, just two questions, uh, uh, nationality? And she says, German. And he goes, hmm, occupation? And she goes, oh no, we'll just be here a couple of days. There's a, <laughs> it's kind of a, it's a I don't, sorry about that. They, uh, they, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I know if there's Nazis in the crowd, they're always getting mad at that, but it's uh, they, um, they, uh, uh, and the other thing is these people, the countries that hate us, like Venezuela and Iran and Russia, uh, they're oil economies, and they've been so crushed financially, they couldn't throw a blender at us. So we're, um, that's, been a, that's been a positive. Uh, the real issue here is that 70% of all oil is used for transportation, and electric cars are real, and they're coming. Sometimes you go to places, and they're like, they, uh, they're like, oh, that's like six hippies in California. No, it isn't. And, uh, and then the other thing I hear all the time is, where are you going to fill up? Whole food? And um, they, uh, <laughs> and you know the you know the way capitalism works, and democracy and capitalism are the only systems that work that work. But you're going to go to bed on Tuesday night with no charging stations and wake up Wednesday morning and there's going to be one on every single corner. So this is the growth of electric cars. Uh, most people think when we get to uh, right around the two and a half percent of the fleet numbers when you really start to see the charging stations come. But this is this is a big, big, big deal. And uh, uh, future fuel, now this is for electricity, um, is you're going to see uh, uh, coal go down as, we need, we're going to need more and more electricity, that's not the question, but it's how it's going to be fueled. Coal is going to go down. Uh, coal is kind of odd. It's, it's filthy and it's much more expensive than natural gas. We're a little biased here. We're a big natural gas state. Uh, the only, now there are some, I guess the administration likes coal. I guess it's part of their new Black Lungs Matter initiative, but it's, um, <laughs> but it, uh, doesn't really make any sense, you know. It's um, there's uh, yeah, I made that up too. And um, they um, uh, nuclear will go down, renewables will go up, and natural gas will go up. So natural gas is a, a big, big thing here in Louisiana, and it's um, and it's one of the you don't think of it this way, but the chemical industry, which is all around Baton Rouge, is doing tremendously well. The expansion is incredible. And, you know, I'm not saying they're not very well run and business isn't good, but the key factor there is low natural gas prices. That's their feedstock cost. And that, these keeping, and having this low natural gas price is a big, big deal. It's um, one of the reasons you're seeing it, by the way, is that these tremendous, these oil fields in the shale in West Texas, I took my students up to there. I don't know if you've ever been to West Texas, but it looks a lot like Mars. And it's, um, it's like God gave them a lot of oil and gas and then left before he put in the uh, bushes or, you know, water and things like that. They, um, because God has a great sense of humor, you know, I did, like how he names people, like Madoff, Madoff with the money, and uh, there's, uh, we're not, don't even go into Anthony Weiner. And um, there's, um, jeez. Oh, or David Pecker, the guy that runs the National Enquirer. I mean, stop, you know. So it's, um, it's um, let's see. Uh, well, he won't be speaking at our church. I think we have that down there. Um, the, uh, the other big thing is the biggest, biggest economic spending in the history of the country is happening in Lake Charles, Louisiana. They have spent $50 billion there to develop the LNG business, liquefied natural gas. It's the most interesting part of energy acro across the board. And I mentioned those big shale fields in Texas. Well, they're finding a lot of oil, a tremendous amount of oil. Because you talk to Texans, you say, how much is there? And it's like, 78 billion trillion gallons, you know. But it's, uh, but they're Texans, you know, that's the thing. It's, uh, you know, like a 10-gallon hat only, only holds three-quarters of a gallon. You know, it's that kind of thing, you know, that you got to think about. Is, um, 
But what they do is they t they've been finding a lot of natural gas while they're doing this, and uh, they're not trying to. They're just creating it, and it's going into the system. So gas here is about three dollars a thousand cubic feet, and um, and so they come in these pipelines all to all to Louisiana and all to Lake Charles, and they take that gas, they freeze it down to 265 degrees below zero, way beyond freezing, and it shrinks the gas into one six hundredth of its size, and then they load them on these ships. Well, why do they do that? Well, because in Europe, you get five to six dollars a thousand uh, cubic feet. We only pay three. And in Europe, you get 11 to 12 dollars for it. So it's arbitrage, and it's phenomenal, and it's growing like uh, crazy. The other thing, the little line up in there, is the fact that up until now, the Russians have been able to have their way with their satellite countries by saying, you know, I'll freeze you this winter because I won't send any natural gas. And now, when this gets big enough, that's just not going to be, not gonna be a, a weapon they can use. Uh, the distinction, of course, is electricity is generated by natural gas, coal, solar, and wind, but planes, trains, and automobiles are run almost entirely on oil. Uh, if you want to know that coal is over, I think this is the end. Uh, the Kentucky Coal Museum is now powered by solar. I think um, <laughs> just wanted to go see that in Louisville. It's quite a, it's quite a sight, really. There's a, uh, oh my gosh, they, uh, it is, um, and I got to put a little plug for our radio show. I, I host Out to Lunch in New Orleans, and the Out to Lunch in, in uh, Baton Rouge is uh, hosted by Stephanie Regal, who is amazing. Uh, Aileen uh, hosts the show over in Lafayette. It's been great. Uh, I have had some great guests in New Orleans. One I had about a month ago that just cracked me up is I had these, this woman, and she hired eight other women, and she has this company. They operate in the North Shore of New Orleans, South Shore, all along the Gulf Coast. And what they do is they come to your house to take the lice out of your kid's hair. Is that great or what? <laughs> and they call their company the nitpickers. It's so awesome. Love this stuff. They, uh, oh, the, and when I was hosting, when I was hosting the show in Lafayette, you know, Lafayette is the nicest people in the state, you know. And I had a, I had a, a, a guy that made a, made rum, and another guy that had beer, uh, uh, at Biotech 31 beer. And they, they were, I was there early at the facility, and I sit with them. And then the beer guy comes and meets the rum guy, and I don't know if they know each other or not. And the beer guy says to the rum guy, he goes, "Whoa, the people you see when you don't have a gun." <laughs> happen you know but I, I guess that means it's like I love you in Cajun or something I don't know it's um oh my gosh it was so strange they uh oh man now this there's a lot of economic lies out there and I think you know political spin is one thing but economic lies change the way you make your decisions like for instance manufacturing you hear we don't manufacture much in this country anymore we actually manufacture more than we ever have in the United States by a good shot but we're doing it with far fewer workers and 87 percent of those job losses in manufacturing are due to efficiencies automation and robotics so we've got these scapegoats like immigrants and jobs going abroad but it is about productivity and it's not going to go backwards it's only going to go forwards uh, and something we actually should be pretty proud of is uh, to do I remember I uh, remember my, my kids are now 24 and 21 but when they were little I guess they were about 10 and 7. I took them to the Coca-Cola bottling facility in New Orleans for a tour because it was brand new. It was very high tech. And it was the size of about three football fields. And, um, and then uh, the management was giving us a tour. And there was only like six employees. And uh, the management says, uh, yeah, no, we got a lot of robots. You know what I like about robots? My kids are just looking at him, you know. And he uh, goes, they don't have fights with their wives. They, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they don't come in hungover, you know. And... Uh, and my kids are like, stranger danger, stranger danger, you know, it's, um, but that, that is what's happening, though. Oh, my gosh, they, uh, oh. Unemployment is near a 50-year low. Uh, it's kind of a lagging economic indicator, so it's a function of what was happening before. But if you're unemployed now, it's some sort of skill or geographic mismatch. On the skill side, we have to retool a lot of people and it's and the corporations have to do it the government's got to do it it's going to cost a fortune but it's the right thing to do it's what's needed and then geographic mismatches you know you you're gonna to have to move a lot of us have had to move for careers overall and uh, that's just what's going to have to uh, have to happen
Now, a lot of people say that unemployment isn't that number. It's much higher. Uh, they say, oh, actually, you know, only 63% of Americans are working, so unemployment's 37%. Now, this is a crazy number. When you hear this, remember, it's a crazy number. It looks at everybody over 16 years old. And so there's students, I think it's good to go to school, and then there's people managing a family, and then there's the disabled, and then there's the retired. You know, we're retiring 10,000 baby boomers a day. So this number is only going to go lower. You know, my, I was, my original title for this slide was, get up, Grandpa! And um, there's a, <laughs> it just, it just is crazy. It's, uh, it's funny, it's funny raising kids when you do economics and finance for a living. I remember when my kids were little, I taught them about taxes by, uh, by eating 38% of their ice cream. And uh, <laughs> it was uh, very effective, I thought. And um, they, uh, and, uh, <laughs> oh. Going back to that coal thing, now they talk about clean coal, which is like an oxymoron, you know? It's like a jumbo shrimp or Dodge Ram or tight slacks, you know? These just don't, um, let's see, they, uh, economics. Um, you know, the we, reason we're in these tariff battles is uh, the president's worried about balance of trade. Balance of trade is a nothing number. Any economist will tell you that. In fact, Adam Smith, the founder of modern economics, said nothing can be more absurd than this whole doctrine of the balance of trade. If we have an imbalance in, of trade, what it is, it just means that our people are wealthier than their people so we can afford to buy more of their stuff. And uh, Alan Greenspan said the tariffs are insane. The interesting thing is no state in the union is more harmed by these trade wars than the state of Louisiana because we are the people that ship things in and out, in and out. We make some things, but it's mainly moving things in and moving things out. It's going to be at a tremendous cost. It already has been. Uh, money flow, one of the things you hear is that uh, the good thing about the tariffs is the Chinese are paying billions of dollars to us and it goes into our, uh, into our treasury. But you know, when you think about it, that's not really true because what happens is those prices are passed along and it's really being paid by American businesses and American consumers. So uh, this is the U.S. debt. I seem to be the only person that still cares about the debt. Uh, it, uh, I think it's still important. I hear about it. Um, it's in chapter one. Is, um, they, uh, but this is the U.S. debt divided by GDP, and the reason this is you divide it by GDP is you're trying to find scale or leverage or how big is it relative to the size of the U.S. economy. So before the meltdown, it was about 37 percent of the of the of GDP, and then the the meltdown in 08, 09, it went up to about you know over 60, 70 percent, and it kind of flattened out. And the Congressional Budget Office was projecting that it would ra rise again, kind of slowly to about 89 percent. In about, uh, in about eight or 10 years. But with the tax cut, it's now gonna go up to 111%, and we're actually already beyond 100%, which to me is like a bells and whistles number, but, but obviously some people don't, uh, don't think that. The um, unsustainable, we right now have low interest rates, growing deficit, and low unemployment. And Buffett said this the other day, you can't have those three things together. Something's got to give, and whether it's inflation or higher interest rates or a decline in corporate earnings or sinking stock price, you just can't have those three all operating at the, at the, same, uh, at the same exact time. Let's see. All right. Oh, I saw this. I thought this was funny from The Onion. CIA realizes it's been using black highlighters all these years. They, um, <laughs> It's a easy mistake to make, and uh, of course now we know the word redacted. We didn't know that actually before. It's uh, our language is going up. Uh, general stuff. Now, this is very important, particularly if you have a rental car. You know, this is a big problem. You take the rental car, you uh, you bring it back, and at the airport, somewhere near the airport, you go to fill up, and it's always a quandary as to what side of the the ga uh, the car the gas goes in. You know, and uh, and you got to fill it up because Hertz charges you like fifteen dollars a gallon, which is which is which is why they call it Hertz. And it's um they um and uh, are they sponsors or something? Oh, good. They uh, it's um. Uh, I once told a Mennonite joke, and there were two Mennonites in the crowd. It's, it's, it's very scary. They, um, they, uh, but it, on your gas gauge of every car, there's a picture of a gas pump and an arrow, and that's where you put the gas. So, you know, years from now, you'll think, oh, yeah, what did the Italian man say again? You know, and um, there's uh, the body's in the trunk. There's, um, let's see, they, um, my father would kill me if he heard me doing these. There's, um, 
they, uh, this is a fascinating number that comes out of the Birkins Institute, and it says that a record number of men are marrying up. Now, when we think of marrying up, we think of marrying somebody that has more money or their family has more money than your family, but this isn't up. This is marrying up educationally, and after a huge gap, it is now in the average household, the average wife makes more than the average, uh, has more education than the average husband. And this really is to be honored. This is pretty amazing. You know, I mentioned sometimes that if you go to a college campus, it's, it's really decidedly female. We're 40, 60, have friends of schools that are 70, 30. Um, it's really, it's, it's kind of an amaz amazing thing that's happened. Our economy is 70% uh, consumer driven. So that's what you have to keep your eye on the ball on. And it's the middle class consumers that are the job creators. That's what they, because they determine uh, how much is gonna be spent. It sounds kind of curt, but the rich already own everything. The poor can't afford anything. It's the middle class consumer. And the reason they're the job creators is because demand creates supply. Supply doesn't create demand. Um, on the immigration battle, you gotta know that 40% of the Fortune 500 were started by immigrants or their children. And at Intel's recent science talent search, only 17% of the applicants were had parents born in the US. So it is a, a big issue. Where are we in this uh, economic expansion? I think we're already in extra innings uh, with the last three economic recoveries have lasted 90 months each. This is, um, let's see, it was up 90 months under President Obama in 20, 29 months under President Trump. So that's 119 months. That's the second longest on record, and 120 is the record. I, I have Fenway Park there. I'm originally from Boston, and I've been to all 30 major league ballparks. So that's uh, And one thing to remember is the stock market is not the economy. And it's, it's not the economy. It's not how happy people are. It's not how much unemployment there is. The stock market is a measure of future corporate profits. And, that's, and people are very, very optimistic about the measure of future corporate profits. Uh, when people tell me that this is all a, a deck of cards and it's going to fall apart, it's all a house of cards, I always quote Tim Dye, as long as people have babies, capital depreciates, technology evolves, and tastes and preferences change, there's a powerful underlying impetus for growth that is almost certain to reveal itself in any reasonably well-managed economy. Democracy and capitalism are the only systems that work. Capitalism is cyclical, but it's the only way it works. And anyone who's bet against the United States since 1776 has lost, and they will continue to lose. I think in the stock market, and I've I handed out our, our handouts here, I hope you get a chance to look at it. Um, we've been in small cap stocks, which has been a tough place to be over the last three years. It's been all large cap stocks. So I, I have to quote the late Dr. John and say, I was in the right place, but it must have been the wrong time, you know? <laughs> and um, so it is, uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, thank you. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC. Specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.